Welcome back to the It's Just Boar podcast, A League of Our Own. I'm Joanna Reardon. I'm Eve Tallon, and today we are delighted to welcome Bethany Carson from Swim Ireland to the show. I guess let's start off with a bit of an overview. Um, do you want to give people a bit of an introduction and background on, say, your relationship with swimming? Because obviously you were involved as a swimmer and now you have, um, you know, built on that and, and you're working with Swim Ireland now. Yeah, uh, so like you said, um, I used to swim for Ireland. Um, I'm originally from Lisburn, up north, hence the accent. Uh, and then I moved to Dublin in 2011. So I've been here 10 years and just hold it on to my accent. <laughs> um, but yeah, so through swimming, um, I had done like bits and bobs for Swim Ireland, like on their participation programs. Um, and I studied sports science and health in DCU. So when I was coming out of my degree, there was a job posting that came up in in Swim Ireland for the National Centre Dublin assistant coach. Um, so I went for it and I still had a few weeks left of college. So I went for it and I got it, which was great. But it meant that the last month of doing my FYP was absolute hectic. <laughs> um, so I started in as the assistant coach and um, just working part time for Swim Ireland. And then a couple of months later, another post came up for the women in sport officer. Um, in the September so this was in 2017 um, so then I, I went for that and got that as well so since then we're nearly four years in now and um, so for my office role I'm responsible for running participation programs um, for women in sport um, and trying to encourage more females to take up coaching and officiating roles and then on the performance side um, I'm back on deck to my old stomping ground uh, at the <laughs> NAC um, and helping the amazing performance team there to coach the swimmers in the water. So it's a really nice balance between performance and participation. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's been good so far. How, like, weird is it, like, as in, like, female coaching, it's not really popular. And, like, also, like, what's the process to be, like, a swim, like, coach? Like, I know in, like, soccer, you have to do, like, badges and stuff like that. So, like, how do you, like, you know, you just applied for a job. Like, what's the process then to be on to the assistant for the national performance uh, team yeah. as well? So I know like as a swimmer, I was quite lucky in terms of swimming is quite gender neutral as athletes. Uh, It kind of seems to go in waves like my Mm -hmm. generation was more female based and then the next generation was more male based. And we're starting to get a few more females in now. But I'd say we're probably still a bit more male based, definitely in the center anyway. Um, but yeah, so in terms of coaching, we have three levels of coaching um, in Ireland. So level one is your assistant coach. So you wouldn't be able to coach to coach on your own. You'd have to have a level two on poolside. And then there's level two where you can lead a group. And then there's level three, which is kind of what you require to be a head coach. Um, so I, I had a level two at the time uh, when I applied for the job. And then since then, I've completed my level three. Um, so we just had actually a big intake for our level three uh, coaching qualification that launched in May. We haven't had one in a few years. So it was really good to see that actually out of 66 applicants, 53% were female. So we're, it's working. We're getting more females <laughs> interested in, in leading on the coaching side. So it's, it's really awesome to see that now. I guess we'll we'll continue on this topic. So, um, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing uh, in your role um, as as women in sport lead, and the kind of work that you're doing to encourage more people in in participation and also in coaching. Yeah, so like Swim Ireland's been really passionate about women in sport for a long time. So we've we've been driving those initiatives for quite a few years. So the main programs um, that I look after are on the participation side. It started Swim Swim for a Mile is one of our biggest participation programs. Um, and basically it takes anyone who can swim two lengths to be able to swim a full mile um, in 10 to 12 weeks. And it finishes with a big fun event that we've all been missing over COVID. <laughs> um, so that started as a Women in Sport initiative through Sport Ireland Women in Sport funding. Um, and then over years, a couple of years, it just became self-sufficient. So it doesn't actually require women in sport funding anymore. But we still see about 65 to 70% of the participants are female. Um, and that's out of around 2,000 people. So, you know, it's great because that uh, demographic of swimmers who, you know, leisure swimmers almost, um, they, like women you'd find are a bit more self-conscious to come out on the poolside, you know, 
in a public group setting, um, but apparently not. Uh, after a couple of years of that program, we've seen huge boosts in it. Um, so that's the big one. Um, so it's not technically a women in sport initiative, but it actually is <laughs> now. Um, and then we have our women in sport coaching and mentoring program. So that's more for our members. So that's to try and encourage more females into the coaching roles. So the way it works is um, some Ireland members get to apply for coaching courses at a discounted fee. Um, so it's kind of enticing them a little bit by reducing the cost barrier. And then we support them after the course by setting up mentorships. So you'd have one side is locally with, um, it could be a coach in your club or a nearby club. And then the other is with Swim Ireland. So it would be assisting someone like myself or another coach or, or former um, international or Olympic swimmer at like a technique clinic for, say, the likes of the Swim for Mile program. Um, so it's really uh, trying to entice them in and then support them from that qualification to active coaching um, mm -hmm. role. So we've seen huge boosts in our numbers from that, you know, we started it in 2018 um, and it really fit in line with the, the 20 by 20 campaign. Um, so since then, we've seen a boost of about, I think we're at 50% female and male, 55% female of level one coaches, 50% male, female, level two and level three. We've still got a bit of work to do, but obviously since that latest course, we're, we're, we're on the right road. <laughs> um, and then the last program is our Swim and Women program. So that started as a beginner program that kind of, it was like a stepping stone to swim for a mile. Um, but we've made that a bit more specific now. So we've done lots of planning since COVID has stopped us actually getting into the pools. So we've done loads and loads of planning uh, for this program, which will target specific um, female groups. So we're looking at um, pregnancy and postpartum, um, midlife or menopause um, period, uh, teenage girls, and then mental health. So we're looking at those four areas. We're doing loads of research. Um, Healthy Ireland and the Irish Society of chartered physiotherapists are endorsing the program um, and at the minute we're working to get the HSE to do the same but basically each program is like a specific aquatic program for that demographic so for the likes of the menopause group there'd be a couple of like chronic diseases that would be more prevalent at that age group so osteoporosis cardiovascular disease and obesity so we're trying to target that um, and trying to make it fun as well but also give them information because it's kind of a taboo subject. Um, and a lot of a lot of women going into the menopause don't actually feel like they have enough knowledge. They feel underprepared. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a shock to the system and then they end up suffering in silence. So mm -hmm. trying to use exercise as a coping strategy, but specifically swimming. So that's my job oh well that's my office job anyway <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's um it's really interesting and I guess like a lot of people when they kind of think of, of swimming they think of kind of learning how to swim maybe as a as a child and then obviously the competitive side so it really sounds like the work that you're trying to do is also build that kind of leisure swimming community I know there's been lots more to say with open water as well um, and, and getting outside the pool um in terms of the performance side um I know when it comes to swimming in particular and athletics to some extent, obviously some of the sports kind of suffer at the hands of this as well. But there's a, a kind of an early dropout age, particularly in swimming, not just for girls, but it seems to maybe be a little bit more on the girl side. I agree with the waves thing. Yes, it depends on the club and it comes in, you know, more women, more, more men. But um, why kind of is the is the reason for for people dropping out um maybe so young because it, it can be around that like 16 17 year old age group and then a secondary question is does it happen in other countries as well is it is it swimming specifically or is it in irish swimming specifically i think well i know when i was swimming when i reached 21 i think i was the oldest female in Irish summon, which was crazy, mm -hmm. but as I felt ancient, and I was oldest by like maybe three years. <laughs> um, so that went on. I, I retired when I was 25, so like relatively young, but again, I, I was one of the oldest females. Um, so if we knew the, the answer, we probably wouldn't have the dropout, but I know mm -hmm. there's a couple of different factors in terms of the, the usual stuff that you see in terms of teenage girls losing interest and kind of wanting to spend more time with their peers. Um, it's a bit, it's a demanding sport. You, you know, you're training, even 
if you're not at international level, you're actually training around the same amount of hours. You know, you're talking about 20 hours a week, maybe even up to 22. And when you count gym as well, you're up at half four to be in the pool for five before you go to school and then you're back in the pool after school. So it is a demanding sport. So it it's all or nothing. I think a lot of athletes would probably look at it that way in terms of if they're coming to that age where they're deciding whether, you know, they like it or not, or is it taking up too much time for academics or are they going to make it or not? Um, they're probably trying to weigh up their options in terms of time commitments. So I think we'd, we'd probably lose a couple due to that. Um, and a lot of people, it's becoming less common now, but a lot of people I know when I was swimming, when they quit, it was like, they walked out the door and they didn't get mm-hmm. back into the pool because they would just been swimming and swimming and swimming for so many years and so many hours and um, that they really just needed a break. And then it would sometimes take like two, three years before they'd kind of get back into even doing leisure swimming. Now we're finding people have a lot better relationship. Um, I think clubs really work hard on trying to work on that transition from if you're deciding to give up the sport rather than just cutting it you know like when I finished I asked asked could I actually wean myself off it and come in so instead of eight times a week it was down to six for a couple weeks then it was down to five then it was down to four so I still had it and I could kind of decide what I wanted to do to keep fit otherwise um we used to run a really big um initiative called the we play inspiring girls in sport conference and it was a it was geared exactly towards that um teenage girls and engaging them in uh all sports it wasn't just swimming so we had a a whole host of different athletes from different Mm -hmm. sports speak on the stage and physios and nutritionists and everything um and one of the biggest um topics every year was well a couple of the top biggest topics were body image um nutrition is one they always want to hear more about they just want to figure out how to get more energy (laughs) um and the menstrual cycle and managing that during training so those are like the three areas that we try to target in terms of giving our members more information about to try and avoid that dropout but at the end of the day we we don't know the exact answer because no it doesn't seem like everybody uh or everyone has a different answer basically Mm -hmm. of why but i think one of the big uh, contributing factors is that it's just such a demanding sport so I was I was kind of curious you know like you say obviously like it's really demanding and this is someone who doesn't have a swimming background like I just would have swam for leisure as well like is there any kind of like bit in between where like you still have competitive swimming but it's not as overly competitive as you said but it's not as like boring as what like leisure swimming would be you know for the likes of you like is there any kind of like line in the middle you know, like obviously we like in Gaelic football you have junior b teams you know stuff like that yeah yeah um, most clubs have like a aquafit club or like a different name or whatever it is but where they just train maybe two or three times a week but i think what summers find is when you lose the feel for the water which if you're not swimming as much as you are it, it feels crap and you felt what it's like to feel really good and really streamlined and for your body position to be completely off it really messes with your head i know even for myself like i would majority of my you know like um to keep fit now would be in the gym because I just feel so unfit in the water even though I could go for four or five k and it would probably be great but it probably wouldn't actually work me that hard because of my technique from being a swimmer so I think they find it hard to not to like all or nothing I think it comes back to that and but there are there's there's varsity competitions as well every year which is really fun so that's universities and they all come together and they race um for the weekend there's a big banquet dinner um (laughs) on the last night so it's it's good crap but um yeah I think they just find it's it's all or nothing (laughs) yeah no I think in in terms of swimming in Ireland like it's I think like leaving certain year is is a, a, a really big one for people. And I think kind of the culture seems to be um, once you leave the pool, that there's kind of no return. And like, I think it's, what is it, kind of 26, 28 is, is, is the peak development for athletes. But we have people leaving at 17, 18. Um, and obviously getting through that leaving certain year, like it is only one year. So like, have you kind of any advice maybe for people that are in that age group and might think that, well, if I stop swimming out for a year, I can't go back because it's it's actually not the case. Um, and they're not actually fully developed athletes at that point. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say 
communication with your coach and your teachers is the biggest thing during leaving cert year. Um, so I come from the north, which is a different academic um, setup. And but when I came down here, I just couldn't believe the amount of pressure that mm-hmm. school kids feel during the leaving cert, and it's huge. But sport can really help you through that. It's not healthy to be thinking about your exams and studying every second of the day. Like you need that outlet. And even when you're when you're going training, I remember when I was swimming as a young athlete for my studying for my GCSEs, I'd be like revising things in my head while swimming. Mm-hmm. I might have miscounted a few <laughs> few laps, but uh, it's it is a nice escape and it really can help you. Like it can support you through those really stressful times. Everybody says exercise helps, you know. So it's about communicating with your coach and your teachers. So on the build up, say if you've got training camps or a really hard period of training coming up during you know a big study period, it's about telling your teachers in advance so they know if you're going to have to miss like miss class for mm-hmm. a trip or maybe you're looking a bit tired. And for the coaches, it's about telling them when your exam schedule is. So maybe you can take a bit of an easier session or maybe you need to miss a session. But it, it without that communication, it'll just end up the, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> the um, the student or the, the athlete becoming over, overwhelmed mm-hmm. and then it's just going to blow up. So it's about having that open communication weeks and weeks before that busy period comes so you can work together on an action plan. Yeah, no, definitely. I think what leaving sort of people do kind of get overwhelmed. And I think a lot of people maybe don't even kind of communicate with their school. Uh, the fact that they might be getting up at half four or five, whatever time it might yeah. be to, to do the training before school. And it is unusual, um, you know, in other sports to maybe have that commitment level at at that age. Um, I remember like an athlete deciding in transition year to walk away from swimming and she would have been one of the you know, top swimmers kind of in the country at the time. And like, it's a big decision for someone who would have been 16 years old to walk away from the sport. So, you know, obviously that communication can help retain people and, um, you know, just get through. It is only a year or two years and then figure out what you're going to do maybe while um, while you're in college. Going back to the body image and, and nutrition piece, um, obviously there's lots of questions there and periods come into it and everything. Uh, we have talked about periods and swimming before, but what kind of would you be, your advice be around um, periods and swimming? Um, it'd be fueling around those weeks. So kind of getting to know your cycle and when you're really struggling, when you're tired or maybe when you're getting cramps. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be a nutritionist now, <laughs> but we, we did do a really good talk with Sharon Madigan, who's mm-hmm. the head of performance nutrition at the Sport Ireland Institute. Um, and she was just, she put it in, in really plain language that I still can't even remember now off the top of my head. But in terms of, if you think about your, your tank, it, it is getting more empty when you go through your cycle, when you're getting towards that week of the period. Um, so it's about making sure that you've got enough iron, that your your that your meals are balanced, but that you also have. I always went everywhere with an emergency snack. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be able to last the day without one. <laughs> um, and for for swimming and other endurance sports like endurance running and walking, yeah, you, you have to be eating enough to fuel your body. And sometimes it's hard to actually get that in. Um, so I one thing I would say I know. Um, even when I was swimming, some of my teammates would be worried about what it would say on the scales or, or skin folds. But really, you have to, one, just measure it against yourself. And two, like you don't need to look at the scales. You, you'll know if you're feeling full of energy. Um, and actually, during your period, it's quite common to bloat as well. So the female body goes through so many changes over a month um, that the scales just like I would throw them away (laughs) um uh, but yeah I I don't know what else I'd have to say about that how like you know like we're obviously talking about body image and like as I said like a non-summer and like the week that I was with you for the Olympic trials like myself and the girl who was with me the other producer and she's a guy head too she was like why are they just all built like Greek gods she's like I've never felt so like like not even like emasculated whatever the opposite whatever like the feminine version of emasculated is um like is that obviously you know something that kind of exists within swimming like you know body image you know people feeling that 
oh, I don't look as muscular as like she does. You know, I have to, as you said, like maybe intensely work out. But as you said, you're in the water, your energy is low. It's not a good combination at all. Mm. It's funny because you're you're trying to fit like two parts of your life in. So when you're at the pool, I, I, I would first say you're in a swimsuit from such a young age that it does not phase you. Like, yeah. Like obviously to a member of the public or someone who doesn't swim or even, you know, running, like it's not a lot of clothes <laughs> that you're wearing, but you're so used to walking around like that, that it, it, it doesn't really come into your head. But if you are self-conscious about it, obviously it is. And especially for athletes who are now coming out of a year or so out of the water or out of their, whatever their sport is, it is going to be a bit self-conscious. So I remember um, a, a British swimmer, Amy Wilmot saying, that at the start of the season, she always used to buy herself a swimsuit that was a size up just so she didn't have to feel self-conscious of feeling that swimsuit was a bit tight, a bit snug um, and giving herself time like to get back fit and, and, you know, her weight will adjust as she has her training increases. Um, so I'd say that for anyone who's coming back after a long time out of the pool, like don't put yourself under pressure, get a bigger swimsuit and let yourself, let your body adjust. Like it will, it will adjust. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so the, the the body image um, as swimmers, the big thing for swimmers is shoulders. We're so self-conscious of having big shoulders, big muscly shoulders. But you you want them in the pool because it's what makes you swim faster. But then when it gets to a weekend and you're going out to lunch or dinner with your friends, you're going to the cinema and you, you feel like your shoulders are just like, you know, this, it's this big thing. Um, I remember as a swimmer as well, it was always in my head. And then when you quit someone, you're like, oh, I wish I had that definition back in my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> so like every woman wants something else that they don't yeah. have. You're never going to be happy. And um, so the sooner you realize that actually you should just enjoy your body and what it's capable of, the better. Um, and mm-hmm. because there's, a, there's every, every girl, every boy out there has something that they don't like about themselves. Um, so there's no point hanging on to it really <laughs> <laughs> yeah even I was like coming in like a like a like a, just a t-shirt you know because it was like so warm in the pool and I like turned to Clara I was like who do I think I am you know like look at me I look like a swimmer out she was like you're so stupid <laughs> <laughs> well when you went to Europeans though you did feel like because they're all so tall so they're not only tanned because they get sun like most of the year <laughs> unlike Ireland but they're tall their legs go on forever and, and so yeah like everybody's self-conscious the, those those same summers that you saw now are, are are at europeans at the minute and they're probably looking at other countries being like god he's so masculine or she's so <laughs> tall and tan so it's yeah, always, it's always the americans i always like stare up. i was like jesus christ like they're built like like they're all they're total californian like people, people. <laughs> like that's my thought process like going through my head <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's like what you're kind of touching on there is really about like what your body does for your sport. And I know we've talked like we spoke to Babe and Parsons before um, and, you know, she was talking about food as fuel. And like there just seems to be a lot kind of in the media and maybe on social media and that as well of like what women should look like or, you know, that type of thing. But it's obviously totally different um, if you're participating in a sport like you need to um, like train your body like you're, you might look a specific way or at least head in a, in, a, in a direction because of the sport that you're involved in so um you know depending on, on the sport like um whether it's gymnastics or swimming or you know long distance running like people are going to have slightly different physiques because of the the sports that they're in um I know Jenny Egan spoke about it as well and um kind of spoke about how she sees her her body as her machine and what she has to to treat it that way so I think for any of the girls watching, like if you want to be successful at sport, that's kind of the way you need to view it um, yeah. and to to appreciate the way that your body is. Um, tell us a little bit about the move into coaching. So obviously you'd, you'd come from, uh, you know, swimming with everybody and, and then you're in as, as, as assistant coach. So what was that transition like for you? It was funny because I never thought about coaching like it just happened naturally I had done coaching qualifications but it was more just to do like on the side or you know because I did enjoy Mm -hmm. the coaching side but I never thought it would be part of my real life job (laughs) so it's been great (laughs) um yeah I really enjoyed it it's um I know there's things that I didn't like when I swam so I tried to avoid that so I I I hate like monotonous long 
boring sessions <laughs> so i really try not to do that but then you don't want to go too far on the other side where you're trying to make every little thing interesting and people are like well, you just give me a break <laughs> um, so it's trying to find a happy medium it was funny because when i started coaching like half of the swimmers in the group were people that i swam with so it was a bit funny for them it was a bit funny for me to try and be like okay i'm serious now you know <laughs> you have to listen to me <laughs> But it did help that I wasn't, uh, that I was always a hard worker as an athlete. So I suppose they did respect me in that end, but then I had to earn respect then as a coach. So hopefully I've got that now. It seems to be working out okay. <laughs> um, but we have, a, we have such a good team there. Our head coach is Ben Higson, um, and he comes from Scotland originally, and he's phenomenal what he's brought to, to Irish swimming in terms of his really like modernizing the sport mm -hmm. um, and bringing Ireland up to like just smarter swimming um and then steve beckleg is the senior assistant coach who's there so they're both there full time um and steve swam as well as very successfully as a as a british swimmer so it's just really nice to have that innovative like aspect of the program mm -hmm. um and then there's myself and then matt coward who is the other assistant coach part-time so like we've got such a huge team compared to the previous program which only had one coach mm -hmm. and an snc coach so you know they're, Swim Ireland have been putting in all the framework to build a better performance system and it, it really does seem to be working so it's just really nice to be a part of that positive change. Yeah I was going to ask what's it like to, to be involved obviously because there's a lot of success at the moment and you know the the team that's going at the moment uh, is going to be bigger than 2016 uh, for the Olympics and obviously we're all have fingers crossed for a, a relay this week yeah, oh, it's hard. It's it's nail biting watching it from home, but it's also really difficult to calculate because usually, so for the relays, usually the Europeans is like the last chance to mm -hmm. qualify a relay, but there is one more chance I think in New Zealand. So we're kind of you're trying to best post the best possible time to put you in the best possible place. So today is a really big chance for the men's four by two free. Um, they posted a really good time this morning and they're into the final. So they went to 7 12. Um, so tonight, I think the goal is to beat Belgium or Belgium's time. They, they're, Belgium aren't in the final um, and Spain's time. But then there's a chance that Canada and New Zealand um, could post times. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Canada can go to New Zealand. So it's very hard to, to guess. But basically, the top 12 uh, places from Worlds in 2019 have secured their place. So then there's four more places to fight for for the rest of the world. <laughs> um, but like it's the first time we've had so many different relays in a position to actually qualify and be close. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing just to see them step up to that challenge like they have done this morning, like posted an Irish record. Um, and over the last two days as well, Mona McSharry is in the final tonight for the 100 breast after doing a really good heat and semi-final again showing that she's ready for the olympics posting a faster time under the olympic time a couple of times now so mm -hmm. yeah like it's just awesome to see it it's so so nice to see ireland up on that scoreboard more and more <laughs> what's like so different about like this group of swimmers in comparison you know i know you mentioned you've got innovative um coaching obviously ben's on board you got kind of more funding and you know that leads to more i suppose you can have more like kind of one-to-ones of different athletes because it's not one doing like a big bunch of athletes. So like, what do you think is so different about this group that maybe necessarily the last groups might have had? No, no offense to your groups. <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> and you, you think... me have too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's belief. Like it comes down to self-belief every time. And the more people succeed in Ireland, the more the people coming through will believe that they can as well. Mm -hmm. So belief but they're also smarter now in terms of the, like they're becoming students of the sport they're following every competition that's online looking at what are what other countries are doing what other athletes are posting so i've noticed the big change in that because i mean i know when i was someone that's something that i could have done much better I, I was just in my own little bath bubble like having a great time getting my training done sleeping eating <laughs> repeat <laughs> But um, they're really like studying, you know, they're studying even strokes of other swimmers, like what they do in their dives, like they're, they'll make great coaches, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is like interesting, like as you say, because I think there's a happy medium between the two. So like worry yeah. about yourself, which as you said, you would have been like more focused on and then, you know, worry about others. There is a happy medium between them. But even I noticed like from being, as I said, there for the week, like they just seem to 
like anytime you'd say to them like oh are you looking forward to europeans it was like it, they were kind of behaved as if they belonged there which is a good thing too yeah a hundred percent yeah definitely they do belong there yeah Talk to us a little bit, obviously you have swimmers that are that are off that level and I know some people previously have either taken gap years or split years and that kind of thing. So for maybe somebody that, you know, believes that they can make it, um, how does one even like go about that? Um, did you split years when you were in college or? Um, so I did it full time, but I did end up retiring uh, in my third year. So I don't know, does that say much about it? <laughs> um, but yeah, we have like we have an athlete, Neve Cohen, who's also you know just outside the Olympic qualifying mm-hmm. time, so she'll have another chance in June um, at that hundred breaststroke time, um, and she split her leave insert into two years to try and give her the best chance. Um, so it's about um, the communication with the school, so um, making sure that that is an option, and if it's not, is there somewhere else that there is an option? So somewhere like the institute in Dublin, um, mm-hmm. which would be quite flexible in, in what way you do your academics. So um, Swim Ireland would uh, be involved in those conversations to you know show that this athlete has real potential and that this is something that you know it's not just because they don't want to do their leaving starts or they're trying to put it off <laughs> um so again it comes down to communicating so communicating mm-hmm. with the coach and then um so that would have been between neve and ben and then john rudd our performance director um it's a big move like like you said you're you're putting it out there that you're seriously going for the olympics um so it takes a lot of guts um, mm-hmm. and it shows a lot of determination so yeah it's, it's it's a big move yeah no definitely and, and I think look I've, I've seen people do it in other sports um you know there have been some of the rowers maybe they taken time away from maybe stepping into work or kind of put college on on pause for a year um but for the likes of you know you're talking about something like the Olympics um that's coming around this year and you can probably go back to college next year so you might lose that much over over a year if uh, if it's something that obviously you can afford to do um obviously I guess that kind of goes into funding so what um what was it like maybe to swim at that level and kind of the funding availabilities um there's been a lot of conversation recently in terms of like funding GA and you know funding available to you know um athletes and sports that are trying to compete internationally so um do you think we need to be making more funding available we're looking for more sponsorships to make sure that athletes can afford to stay in their sport yeah, I mean, Swim, Swim Ireland have done a lot of work to try and support athletes. So at the minute, like, and it was the same when I was swimming in terms of we have um, the National Centre is at the National Aquatic Centre in Blanchestown, so on the Sport Ireland campus. But we also have an athlete house there <laughs> where athletes can stay for like really low um, rent. You're never going to find a rent like that anywhere else in <laughs> Dublin. Um, but that's like one less thing that people have to worry about them you know they have their house and also if they don't have a car it's right beside the pool it's right beside buses to get into college Um, so yeah I mean obviously I'm going to say yes we need more money (laughs) give us more money (laughs) Um, it's hard it's hard to get funding Um, you're talking about podium finishes or finalists at world championships Um, I think they've I can't, I can't remember exactly what the protocol is going forward in the next funding year, mm-hmm. um, but I think they've made it harder from previous years, which obviously, you know, for, to make sport progress, I suppose you have to look at that. Um, but the the more we can utilise sponsorships, um, as long as it doesn't interfere with training, because then you might have some people worrying too much about what they have to do <laughs> for their sponsors and what commitments they have to get to. Um, but it's like for swimming, it, it's hard to make a... a you know a job you know unless you're really internationally really really good it's hard to make money out of swimming you know you're surviving so you're doing it because you're determined on the goal that you've set you're not Mm -hmm. doing it for money (laughs) um except there there is a competition the international swimming league that was created um a couple of years ago which has been amazing for that side of the commercial side the glamour side of swimming um, so we had two summers in that mm-hmm. this year, or sorry, last year, Shane Ryan and Dara Green. Um, and you can make like good money from that, from that, from being on those teams. And it's really fun to watch, like it's entertaining. 
Um, yeah, so that's definitely. really good for the sport. Yeah, it's it's like it's like the swimming NBA, I suppose, but yeah, in the yeah. in the baby years, like it's just it's starting like all the lights and everything. It just it, like you're saying, kind of glamorizes it and makes it look like so exciting. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that's what's what started though the, the swimmers of Ireland now becoming more interested in what's going yeah. on elsewhere and actually watching times that have been posted and on, on other sports. So it's benefiting the sport. So the more stuff like that that we can do, the better. Um, but yeah, like, it's it's hard to make money out of swimming mm-hmm. if yeah. you're not doing it for the money. <laughs> it's kind of generally like a thing, and I think in general with like participating in sport, like you know, it's the outside stuff that kind of defines whether you're obviously like wealthy or not. You know, like even if you look at some of the like top Olympians, like it's not winning the gold medal. Like winning the gold medal is great, but that's not the money. The money is from like the mm-hmm. talks, you know, the events, the sponsorship, you know, that you kind of mm-hmm. come out of that. So you're right. Like it is really interesting. I was kind of curious yeah. when you kind of said about like kind of funding is getting harder because you want to obviously progress the sport. You know, how do you, I suppose, make it up in a way where you want to progress the sport, but you're also trying to bring in like kind of more individuals who necessarily mightn't be as good, you know, like how do you kind of weigh up that option? Obviously you want to, put a good chunk of your money into your medal hopes but then for the like lagger behind who like might have an outside chance like how do you kind of weigh that up and, and how do you like kind of decide it that way well we don't decide the funding sport Ireland yeah. decides the funding so we just support the athletes in getting there <laughs> um but um I suppose like we like we would have a lot of different initiatives and there, there is opportunities to make a little bit of money in terms of mm-hmm. like what I did as a swimmer helping out on participation programs so like mm-hmm. coaching doing technique clinics for um the programs or the clubs so we would have a lot of athletic um clinics with our clubs so we even did them over covid we did talks um online um and the clubs got them for free we got a bit of funding and we're able to pay the the swimmers to to speak at that so it's it's teaching the athletes like you actually can you know make money out of this because of your experience and and the stuff that you're doing is not normal. And that's why it's so great. And people want to hear about it. Um, that's something that athletes forget. Like what they're, what they're doing, no matter the sport at, at that level, like it's, it's amazing. It's people want that in their life. So whereas, you know, if, if people are looking at, you know, we're going back to the teenage girls who are thinking about maybe quitting, like what they're doing is amazing. And their friends want that. They want mm-hmm. that fitness. They want that confidence. They want that, um, achievements but you can't see it when you're in it so it's really hard to actually get get people to see like what what they're doing is amazing <laughs> talk to us um, about the the highlights of, of your career so what was the kind of most memorable moment for you oh that's a good one God, i haven't thought about this in a while <laughs> that's i a would curveball. say to start off like the athletes that i'm coaching now are much better than i was so like we'll bring up bring my ego down here <laughs> before <laughs> i go in um my favorite moment um i one of the favorite moments would probably be breaking michelle smith's 100 butterfly um irish senior record so i think it was hell for like 13 years or maybe more i'll need yeah i'll double check that <laughs> um <laughs> But that was a really big record that like people wanted to see get broken. So I was delighted to break that in the hundred fly. And that was uh I think it was my f- within within the first year of moving to Dublin. So it was kind of like, okay, this is the right decision to move um down to the Stife. Um but yeah, it was a really, really nice uh memory to have. And then a funny follow-up was a couple of years later, maybe two two or three years later um we swam the hundred fly and one of my really good friends broke my record beside me <laughs> so i wasn't up to it in that day and she broke it and there's a really nice picture at the end of me holding up her hand just being like yeah well done like she <laughs> she deserved it but it's a really nice memory as well it's probably like it shouldn't be a good, a good memory, but it was. It was a nice one. Um, I, I broke my ankle uh, in twenty third in December of twenty thirteen, and I I before twenty thirteen I'd kind of gone through. I'd missed the twenty twelve Olympics. Um, we were trying for the relay in the four by two, and I'd had a few months where I just was a bit, a bit off. But by the December that year, I'd came back and at European short course, I felt really like confident. I did a lot of PBs. I felt great. And then two weeks later, I tripped down a step and broke my oh, ankle. No. So, yeah, and I ended up having to get surgery. 
and I ended up getting surgery to get plates. Uh, I got a plate and it was two bricks. So I got a plate and eight screws or something. And the day I had my surgery was the day the Commonwealth Games qualification opened. So before that had opened, I had five times like done. And then because of the injury, like I did really good work to get back. And I'm like, I was really happy with the amount of work they put in, but I didn't get qualifying in the end. So it's annoying, but it's also, I find the time of being injured really interesting in terms of you could get like little goals every day. So it was motivating. Like it was almost the most motivated I've ever been, even though I didn't get to the goal in the end. Um, but that that would be one thing even for other athletes like when you're injured there's always something to train and you you actually because like when you're competing at a high level it's so hard to get pbs obviously you're mm-hmm. not gonna get a pb every time you go out but when you're injured yeah. it's like every day is a pb like you're just improving a tiny <laughs> tiny bit <laughs> like being 12 again yeah it's amazing <laughs> Um, yeah. so yeah I'd say that yeah. for anyone who's struggling with an injury as well yeah definitely like Phil Ely um, broke her foot I'd say it must be like 18 months ago or, or maybe it's two years at this stage I'm like you know look at what she's been doing in the, in the last couple of months um, so there yeah. definitely is room to come back and I, I think people kind of find that sometimes that you know I've had too much time away when it might actually be time to work on something else and just yeah. you know breathe a little bit <laughs> it's not it, it may not be the end of your career um, definitely yeah. kind of stick at it I mean, even COVID's taught us that. So so the swimmers did get back in for some time trials last year, like in between the lockdowns. And there was a lot of PBs. So there was a lot of swimmers mm-hmm. swimming faster after having time out of the water. So sometimes a bit of time off the sport is like good for the head, good for the body, you know, reset. They didn't look like they were loving the running. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. Swimmers aren't made to run. <laughs> <laughs> But they were really good at getting uh, core stability. So their core mm-hmm. stability is like impeccable now. We, we were doing four sessions a week every day of abs and, and circuits. So it now means when we get back in or some of them are back in that, you know, there's less chance of them getting injured after being out of the water for so long. So there's positives, but obviously they're, it's, it's, it's been tough for them. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the impact COVID has had, I guess, on swimming as a whole, not necessarily performance, because obviously, like we've heard about the maybe the worry of um, kids not being like learning how to swim and, um, you know, maybe some of that drop off um, as well. So, yeah, that's the big one. It's the kids lessons. There's a whole year and a bit now where kids haven't learned how to swim. And it's like it's as long like it's going to be hard to try and get that back, you know, especially when it's when we've been trying to build it into the school system um, and we have our Get Ireland Swimming um, national program. So that's a big worry if you think about how many kids have now missed out on learning to swim when they're going to be delayed and getting that mm-hmm. and it's going to cause a backlog. So now, you know, there's the next wave that you have to get, you have to get ready to learn to swim. Um, so that that is a, a big worry. Um, one thing that we have seen is open water swimming has just exploded. People are absolutely loving it, which is great. Um, so we've tried to educate um, on the safety side because obviously you don't want people going out who aren't ready to go out so we've got loads of programs going on starting in june and for anyone who's like wants to even just go in and dip or wants to be able to swim like 100 meters or wants to be able to swim a thousand meters and so open water swimming that's been a huge bonus that like that's just going to keep growing i think now it seems like infectious like once you get that cold water hit it's addictive (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah the clubs it's it's going to be interesting to see how the clubs like i know a lot of the clubs are struggling in terms of money um Mm -hmm. trying to survive um and pools trying to survive so they'll they'll survive to reopen but hopefully they they do last when they reopen you know and Mm -hmm. we'll see how many athletes we've lost or how many athletes have been more motivated so time will tell i suppose in that aspect but i know it's it's tough it's tough because the kids who have been back in school have been able to play basketball and like mm-hmm. football and whatever else. And, you know, they're saying chlorine kills COVID. So, like, why can't we get into the pool? But, yeah, it's just it's a bad yeah. year for everyone. <laughs> but you've got to do what you can do, I suppose. <laughs> 
I was going to say, I think it's dropping anyways. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, no, my is dropping me, so you're going to have to take over. <laughs> no, sometimes we, like, uh, talk over each other, and then other times we look at each other, and we're like, have you got your question? You <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so funny. But usually people take it, um, take it pretty okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the last question for me is, um, if somebody wants to start swimming and maybe have lots of sport and are looking to re-engage, because... Like you're saying about COVID, I actually think um, people have like started to want to come back to maybe sports they've been involved in before. And um, I think life has slowed down in some ways that they may be appreciating things they had before. And um, what would your advice be? Because like I know we're talking, I'd right, say in competitive swimming, like a lot of the clubs, like the oldest might be anywhere from 17 to 21. So um, is there kind of room maybe for someone in their mid 20s or 30s to kind of go and, and get involved I know there's um, masters in the aquatic center anyways and there's some other yeah. teams um what would you advise people to do yeah absolutely there's a place for everyone like someone is a life sport you know you can do it from a baby right up till you're about to pop your clogs so you know and it's easy it's easy on the bones so it really mm-hmm. is a life sport so definitely there's something for everyone um, if you're a former swimmer and you're looking to get back in just to do a couple sessions a week, I'd say get in touch with your club. So if you've moved from where your club was based when you were younger, go to your local swimming pool and find out you know, what the club is and inquire there. There will be a group, whether it's Masters or Aquafit. Um, and if, if you don't want to do that, you can send an email to us at participation at Swim Ireland. We have loads of programs. If, you, if you're a pool swimmer and maybe you think, oh, I might do some open water races <laughs> uh, or you've never swam in your life, but you want to actually be able to swim, like we, ha- we have a program for you. So male, female, you know, disabled, able-bodied, whatever. <laughs> Just send us an email, participation at Swim Ireland, and we'll sort you out. <laughs> it's my aim. It's my aim to get back swimming this year anyway. So I've been I've been out for too long, guys. But I haven't even been like competitive. We're bringing Daisy to the product center so we'll have a great time. Uh, I, was, yeah, I thought you were going to race you. I was like, no, please don't race me. <laughs> go on, you should do swim for a mile. I was actually thinking about doing it this year, like no joke. Um, I was thinking about it. So yeah, we're no. doing it in we're doing it this summer in outdoor heated pools. Oh, nice. And then, yeah, and then next year we'll be doing a January to May. So there you go. You can take your pick. <laughs> send me, send me a link, Beth. To yeah, you can, you can download in. the program for free as well and follow it in your own time. I have to find my pool. That's my thing. I have to <laughs> where, find where are you based? So I would either go, I would either go Cork or Kerry because I'm in between both. I can do yeah. both. Kerry has three pools that do some for mile. Killarney is one of them, isn't it? Killarney is one of them, yeah. They did it in 2019. Oh, I'll yeah. send them an email. So I'll be like, Beth yeah. sent me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's me signed up. Niamh, yeah. I've signed you up for enough sports. I think it's time for me to sign she myself knows. up for one. Every time, every time we talk to someone, Joanne's like, yeah, so Neve's going to try it and I'm going to record the whole thing. And I'm like, um, she signed me up for AFLW. And I was like, yeah, you're like, doing I'll that. Just- I was like, I'll just do the drills. I was like, I, I don't think I can do any of the tackling. <laughs> yeah, she, she's going to do the full kit and caboodle and then I'm going to do my yeah. swim for a mile and then we're going to be like athletic freaks like when it comes to like the end. It's going to be class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to chat to us. We're really delighted to have you on and we'll definitely be looking out for the different programs that you're running and make sure that everybody knows about them. No worries. Thanks so much for having me, girls.